I was thinking the other day, randomly, like how hilarious this whole like walk me to my truck thing has been when it comes to Brendan Shaw. Then randomly, I stumble upon this tweet regarding this from this guy called Eric Jackman, who I'm not really that familiar with, but it came across my feed, I guess, because, you know, I'm liking certain things and it pops up into your algorithm, whatnot. And he happens to be a social media director for MMA fighting. And he put up one of the most funniest tweets that I've read in a long time. It's an image of Khabib and Kamara Usman Khabib is explaining something to Kamara Usman in his sort of deadpan way that he does where he comes across really funny. Kamara Usman, eyes closed, is laughing from the pits of his belly at this humorous joke that Khabib is making. And the caption above it is, <laughs> is written in Khabib's speech. And it says, he say to her, walk me to my truck. Can you believe this, brother? Right? In the way that Khabib would say it. <laughs> and it legitimately made me laugh out loud. It got me very close to spitting whatever fluid i had in my mouth but i wasn't drinking anything so that couldn't happen but regardless it made me laugh so freaking much and judging by the comments down below other people also enjoyed it and it got me thinking will this meme ever die probably not right probably not it will never die this walk me to my truck meme especially when you hear the song when you hear all these edits from the homeless cats it's just it just gets into your brain and you can't let go of it you just keep kiggling it to yourself again and again and again but it also made me think to myself has there been occasions in my life where I've had a very embarrassing interaction with a female that just on the at the moment it sounded like a good idea because I'm sure again whoever it, this may have been some people are alleging it wasn't Brennan or somebody else whoever this person was that said walk me to my truck to flip in um or my to my truck to Annie Liederman outside of a you know comedy club whoever that person was in that moment they felt like they were saying something in that moment they felt like yeah wait until she hears this right then she's going to be slipping all over the place i'm gonna have to get a mop out right when i when i finish giving her this little bar he probably thought that that was going to secure the deal that was going to be the way that he was going to get this person's gob all over their private parts for sure for sure right but it didn't go it didn't go down that way right and there's probably a lot of extenuant circumstances that are kind of attached to it. i think when you kind of read between the lines i think no some i know actually i had a i had a female commentator uh leave a comment on one of the clips i mentioned about this whole thing where she said something like oh because i think i made the assumption or i made the assertion or made it be known that somehow i felt like the girls were kind of bragging weirdly enough that you know this person was into them and kind of creeping around their partner's back blot not and it was a weird sort of humble brag and that person was like to me no that isn't that's just how women talk in terms of trying to process something that they kind of feel as if like they've been complicit but it's kind of like a weird sort of like defense mechanism thing because you don't want to feel like you were complicit in it but then you kind of do because society makes you feel that way and i don't know it was a very clever kind of interpretation of it in terms of like a woman's point of view which is very much appreciated because obviously i'm speaking about it from a really dunderhead kind of dude's point of view but i really do think in a guy's head it never is that deep which is what makes it even more frustrating for the partner of the guy because it seems like there is no way of kind of stopping that brain no you could you can't stop the brain but you can stop the action you might think about telling somebody walk me to my truck but you don't do it because you're a grown-up you have responsibilities it's not worth it <laughs> you want to see your kids right you start all these little scenarios playing in your head but you're thinking about it in your head that kind of that that thing never really turns off in general but it also made me think to myself when you watch past the clip i think part of the reason why because again it's, it's never that complex with guys i think it's always black and white you see someone you like or somebody that you want to maybe hook up with and you just the first thing that comes to your head, you just spit it out if you want to, right? Especially if you're nervous. You just try and spit it out and see what happens. But in a woman's point of view, there are loads of things that go into her this decision making process decision making process as to whether or not she's going to be happy to walk you to your truck, right? Loads of things go into it. If you listen to what Anne Liederman said, you get the impression because she didn't respect the person that was saying this to her it didn't matter what they said or what they looked like the respect wasn't there it wasn't even a thing about attraction you see didn't want to mention attraction or the muscles or six packs whatever guys think about right the arms you know the standard guy things are oh, the trainers the drip that wasn't mentioned what was mentioned again and again was this respect um you kept hearing her mention stuff about she has a lady da -da -da -da, like the cheap way like again and the, the kind of cheapening dehumanizing way it kind of made her feel where he like in his head thought walking me to my truck was like somehow a naughty sort of secret like shh 
naughty America, <laughs> right, kind of thing. No, she didn't see it that way. She saw it as in like, you think I'm one of those? I think she was says in the clip, right? You think I'm one of those girls? I'm one of those girls that can just like finger blast in the hallway on the way to do your set. Do you know what I mean? No, nah, that's not me. And it kind of, that's what made her feel even that's what made it feel even more sort of like pissed off that this was happening in that time, in sort of real time. But it got me thinking about times that I've done it myself, right? Where I've said kind of similar walk me to my trust comments. And I think one example was back in the day, I went to some house, I don't know, I went to like a rave. Wait, was it a rave or a party? I think it was a rave or a party, right? And for whatever reason, I don't know what happened to me. Like, I think I was just way off. Whenever I'm on the bubbly, I'm on the red wire, or I've taken too much yak or something along those kind of lines, or I'm on too much yak, <laughs> right? I always kind of get a little bit too loopy. And I'm usually a confident, boisterous guy. Anyway, I don't need to have any enhancements to get me to talk to somebody that I'm interested in. I could do that with my eyes closed. No bother, right? But for whatever reason, on that day, on that night, I kind of, something came over me where I kind of, and I think it was a male, maybe it was that kind of thing where like I felt I was better than the guy that she was standing with or something. I don't know, I don't know what it was. I felt competitive and then I saw this girl that I liked. I was like, mm, why is she with this dork? Mm. I had that kind of, it was, a, it was a weird, it might have been even hater energy. I don't know what it was. It was something disgusting that I didn't like about myself at the time, after the, after the occasion. But at the moment I felt, you know what? I'm a flex. I'm going to remind this person where they are, who I am, what the situation is. And honestly, without any sort of like interaction prior, without any eyes, nothing, just I went in cold. I must have tapped the lady behind the shoulder or something. She turned around and I said, I whispered something like, why don't you mess with a real nigga? Or something along those kind of lines, right? And if you know me personally, you know, number one, I don't even say the word nigga in like a colloquial term. That's not something that I use in the way that I speak. I don't even speak in that sort of like cadence, right? Why don't you come and fuck with a real nigga? Like some sort of American gangster. That's not how I get down. But for whatever reason, on that night, I legitimately thought that was what would get me like, would get me the situation that was what would get me so that was that's what that i thought that was what would get me to get that girl to walk me to my bus not to my truck i didn't have a truck back then i don't have a truck now walk me to my bus stop right that's what i thought would work <laughs> and clearly it didn't i remember the girl just looking at me like perplexed and just kind of walking back to her friends like in a friend group and then just sat like, talking to me and then just trying to and then i think you know when you're when you're a dude and you've kind of got that kind of first and hunger it's just dripping from your face just emanating desperateness and sleaziness and you just you, you just you just look disgusting right usually you don't see it in yourself until the person reflects it back into you like you don't notice how bad you come across until that person kind of scrunches their face and i remember kind of feeling like an ant so small when she kind of like grimaced did look and uh, talk to her friend and kind of just like kept the same face like uh, said something to her friend like whispering her, what this what is this black cunt talking about he said something about and she whatever she <laughs> and then she turned back with the same grimace and i kind of just slowly try to do the homer simpson walking back into the bush thing just so i can leave like i felt so embarrassed but i remember that being one of the kind of standout things i remember going back home on my way home on a bus like thinking why did you say that? Like, why did you say it in that way, in that cadence, in that weird, possessive, almost like viperish menace? Like, why did you say that? Like, why? And again, like I said, let's be clear. There was no interaction prior. No eyes, no flirty sort of glances, no rub, no nothing, zero. I just went up to a stranger and said, why don't you fuck with a real nigga? And expected to get a good response. Honestly, legitimately one of the most embarrassed situations I've ever had in my life. Um, and again, this was like a random party. So it wasn't, I don't think it was, you know, I'm not saying bad, it's comparing it, walking to my truck, you can't compare. But in this situation, I would say this is worse because it's a peer. I've always been, even though I may have done, maybe again, I haven't done it in the past, I don't think I have, but usually when it comes to peers, people that you kind of work in the same industry for or same industry with, I'm real stickler because again, I think in general, especially when it comes to my sort of like work world in terms of dance music and techno and DJing and stuff, there's not enough girls out there anyway in general, right? Playing. And I think that's a real shame. There should be more out there. There should be more out there playing because I've always said in terms of the song, in terms of the set, um, set list, sort of like, 
put in together and the playing on the night, women just have a different sort of touch and it adds to the whole real allure. I don't think anyone could argue that if you go to like a Boudicca night or you go to like an Inferno night where people are playing who would identify as non-binary or female, whatever it may be, the vibe is different. And it's far, it's not, I would say it's better, but it's just different. It's a nice, it's refreshing to go somewhere where it's not just a whole set of dudes. It's nice to have that in the kind of, um, in the kind of programming of the weekend. It's nice to have that so much. So, so I try to go out of my way when it comes to people within the dance music scene, especially when it comes to girls, to be like, cool and just be cordial. You don't have to be horny. Just be cordial. Just be safe. Talk to them, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I saw you that time, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Just be safe. And I think that's always nice to do in general. If anything happens further down the line, fair enough. But I think it's nice to just be cordial with your peers, especially when you work in the same industry because you just don't need to be horny all the time. Just work with people. It doesn't matter if they've got boobies. Just work with them. So I think in that case, that's where it becomes a little bit more slimy because like I'm a peer. So you're treating a peer like some road dog or no, like some lot lizard or whatever, right? Or somebody you might have met randomly in a club and it's like, and also the risk reward situation is not worth it, right? Because if it goes well, what's going to happen? You're going to leave your wife for Annie Lindemann? Probably not. Are you going to continue hooking up with her on the side? Probably not also because it's going to be a bit weird and messy over time. It just doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Like it's just a weird, the risk reward thing is just really off. Especially when you consider the amount of attention those guys get anyway. As a comedian, you'd imagine being on stage and stuff, blah, blah, blah. It's just a weird thing to do overall. It's just weird. But it just made me laugh when I saw this meme. I was like, honestly, this meme will never die and it shouldn't because it's such a preposterous thing to say to somebody, walk me to my truck. But again, as a dude, I can't get too... I can't get too much on my soapbox and wag my finger because legitimately I think I've said so many stupid things to people too in attempt to get them to hook up with me that have been that in my head I thought sounded like oh these are bars oh my god they're not going to be ready for it they're going to faint we need to get a stretcher we need to call the ambulance beforehand bro we need to get a bottle of water we need to get a fan here because my god and then when you when it comes out of your mouth you're like oh no that did not sound the way I wanted it to sound but absolute legend and then of course to kind of cap it off in terms of that, I saw this amazing clip again, courtesy of the Fire and the Kids subreddit, where they're talking about narcissists. And it's just funny off the back of what I'm going to talk about next with concerning Juicy Smollett to see Brennan just sit there and have no self awareness or understanding that this could also maybe be applied to him. And I think, in general, that is weirdly enough his superpower. And what we, I think that's weirdly his superpower in general. I think so. That I just go, you know, I just go because. I don't think he ever, I don't think there's ever been a moment, even during the Ariel Hawani situation, I don't think there's ever been a situation in this in, in Brennan's entirety of his time spent making content where he's legitimately sat down and thought about for one second why people don't like him and also come away to the conclusion that maybe they have a point. I don't think he's ever sat down and thought, you know what, maybe they have a point. Maybe I do do this. That's annoying. Maybe I do say things like this that could be misconstrued. No, I don't think he's ever had that. I think in his head, he legitimately thinks everyone that doesn't like him is an idiot and everyone that everyone should like him. Do you know what I mean? Like that's generally how he comes across. And you can see this from this little clip where Brent, Brian talk, talks about narcissist and Brendan basically is like, yeah, true. Zero. You ever like, met a, you a, you ever yeah, met like, a real narcissist? I have. And they, they, can, they never, ever, like you can see them. It's fascinating, actually. You can see them their whole life and they they have one burnt bridge after another they have they have a thousand falling outs with a thousand people and it's always their, their fault. fault yeah it's and never there's one common denominator it's it's them, but they yeah. don't that, realize they it. don't realize it <laughs> even after 60 years old they don't realize it it's but just think about just think it's like but just like the btk killer like ah oh, he's a legend isn't he? honestly he is um, I, I, I always say brendan shulman is the american dream or the, you know, the Western dream, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, be able to make it with just, z I wouldn't say zero talent, I'm not zero talent, but like, be able to make it to that level despite all the flaws that you have, right? And never change it. Like no self-reflection, no growth, no nothing. Just, no, we just go. That's the American dream, really. Everyone would love to get away with that, but we don't have, we all don't have Joe Rogan as our kind of best buddies to kind of launch our career. Because if he did, it would be, it would be great, but... Jesus Christ, man. What an absolute legend. Like, yeah, narcissists, man. They're crazy. They never change. They never reflect. It's like, brother, they could be talking about you. But anyway, we move, we move, we move.